Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Moore, and I'm excited to be here to share the perspective from the beef industry. My personal background before coming to Cattle Empire is in a rural mixed animal practice, and so when we talk about antimicrobial stewardship and um, things like that, I, I have that background from small animal to large animal um, to bring to the table. And let me tell you, some of the mixed animal practitioners um, that you all know and work with they have some challenges ahead in, in antibiotic stewardship as well and um, shouldn't be left out of the conversation too. So um, I just wanted to give a perspective. This will be more from the feed yard standpoint. Thank you. Um, and what we do specifically at Cattle Empire, um, like Eric said, I was, um, I'm part of the animal welfare and health team there and we have two on-staff veterinarians myself and Dr. Siklocha and then we actually have um, the day-to-day -day, uh, employees that take care of the animals. I like to call them caretakers because they're more than cowboys, they're more than processors, they really are the extension of the veterinarian oversight that we provide. Um, cattle Empire as a company is the largest uh, family-owned cattle feeding operation in the United States. And so with that, we have some really fun initiatives in my mind um, and support from the ownership group that Dave and I are allowed to have antimicrobial stewardship conversations like this and keep that at the forefront of our decisions and our initiatives and, and protocols that we design. And so that's a lot of fun um, to work there and I'm, I'm just really pumped to be a part of that team. Um, I put this slide up there not to pull the audience on which toolbox I should get my husband for Father's Day, um, but you guys can throw that in in the hallway afterwards. Um, I think as a veterinarian, a lot of times people think of us as we are grabbing an antibiotic. That is our only tool. And I just can't stress enough, especially in the beef industry, but just in the animal health, health industry, is that it's one of our tools, it's one of our technologies, but it's not the only thing that I can talk about or grab when I'm trying to make an, an impact on animal health. And so I put that up there um, just to drive that home that it is an important tool of ours, but it's not the only tool. Um, some of the practices I wanted to touch on what we focus on at Cattle Empire. Um, many of you in the room that have pretty good knowledge of the beef industry can attest to the diversity that we deal with um, because of how many different sectors there are in the beef industry. And so sometimes when we get to the feeding sector, we get a lot of challenges from the management of cattle from all over the United States. Um, one thing that's unique about Cattle Empire is that we do have the on-staff veterinary oversight, and that is something not to take anything away from our consulting counterparts. You know, most of the big companies will have a consultant come in one or two times a month, but it's really an interesting um, kind of dynamic to work with the employees that take care of the animals on a daily basis, and they know that they can call Dr. Dave or I any time of any day, which is sometimes not the most convenient thing. Um, and then we also have the ability, uh, we have a couple of um, employees that have come over from Mexico and so they receive really good training and have a veterinary degree in the Mexican education system and they couldn't be licensed veterinarians necessarily in the United States, but their level of knowledge is really high and we really use that at Cattle Empire to train other people and to kind of make Dr. Dave and I's initiatives go throughout the company a little easier. Um, I, I feel dumb saying that I use bedding and hay as a huge tool to curb antibiotic use at, at the feed yard because that sounds so simple and so elementary. Um, but I point it out all the time because it is my first reaction. Um, Kansas affords us some really unique weather opportunities. And so last week, as an example, I didn't think it would give us an example for today, but um, we had a day where it was 80 degrees one day, beautiful um, spring day, and then the next day it was 19 degrees and snowing. So um, you can imagine some of the challenges that we run in um, taking care of animal health and animal care at that point. Um, the picture on your guys's 
it's on my right, <laughs> is the bedding machine that we have at one of our facilities that just throws out the straw for, um, for the animals. And then not, it was like two and a half minutes later, all that commotion in that pen, you would think, you know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of commotion, and um, all of those animals are laying down, bedded down, very comfortable. That kind of support for the immune system is something that I can't write a lot of scientific articles over, but I can tell my employees when they think a pin is falling apart, um, when they think a snowstorm's coming, when they think it's going to be 105 and 40 degree or 40 mile per hour wind tomorrow, I throw out bedding first. And so I put that out there for everyone to show the industry, show our consumers that that's my first gut instinct and and we get cattle to calm down lay down if they've been traveling they're no longer bawling in the pen they are bedded down and comfortable and that has got to do their immune system a lot of good um, and if not it's the right thing to do and it's pretty cheap so um, animal handling is something at cattle empire it's a lot of um, a lot of time is spent on our initiatives and protocols that we work with the employees um, just calm good stockmanship is what we promote. Um, we have all of our employees that work in the processing barns on cameras, and so they really hate it when the weather is bad and they know Dr. Barnhart's sitting in her office watching them. So they, uh, they get me out of the office and I'll go out there and give them pointers and say, you know, this isn't how we handle animals, let's do it this way. Um, you guys have your iPod blaring, let's turn the music down so that the cattle can enter the barn with a little less um, intensity. Um, and so animal handling is a big part of my job, obviously just keeping employees trained and, and knowledgeable about it. Facility design is something that I really enjoy. It's not something I learned a lot about in veterinary school necessarily, um, but being an on-staff veterinarian, we get the opportunity to really be involved when we are designing new facilities at Cattle Empire. And so if you follow YouTube or um, like the Cattle Empire uh, social media accounts, Dr. Dave and I just put out a video on our brand new processing barn. Um, we were specifically able to design different aspects of that barn to address some issues that we were seeing with animal handling. And so affecting that kind of change on the company level is a lot of fun when you look at facility design. I'm not an engineer by trade, but engineers aren't animal scientists either. So we all kind of have to come to the same um, table and, and agree on some things. Um, and then we have you know people who price it all out and yell at the vets for how expensive our ideas are. but. I wanted to touch base on some of the um, research that we do and the diagnostics that we do um, within our company that really help us keep antibiotic stewardship and um, the antimicrobial resistance issue at the forefront of some of the things we do. One thing um, diagnostic wise you'd think Cattle Empire has five different feeding operations and they're all located in one county. And so one would think that the veterinarians could be at all of the facilities in the day. Um, if there were a dead animal, we could help necropsy it or autopsy it um, and figure out the cause of death, but it just doesn't work logistically. And so we have our employees trained. We have specific employees at each facility that perform the autopsies and then take a series of pictures that we require and they upload them online. This is a huge help for Dr. Dave and I when we're trying to solve issues because I can see the cause of death on all of these animals while we're working through the problem. I'm not invited to the party 10 minutes late. I'm, I'm in, in the problem and kind of can help those guys work through issues. And so I really think that um, using that tool is an important part of my job on a daily basis. Another important part of my job is some of the research that we conduct. Cattle Empire gets asked to do a lot of different industry-related research, and I enjoy that part of my job um, because we get to see some of the newest tools. Um, but we can also push the envelope and see how those tools can help us be better stewards of antibiotics. And so a lot of times we don't say yes to a research project unless it falls in line um, with the idea of how do we reduce antibiotic use. Um, one of the studies that I 
I'm finishing up right now at one of our facilities is a white blood cell differential test. We can do it shoot side, it's a 30 second test, so we can do it in the period of time that the animals are already in the shoot. And it's, it's really showing some promising patterns on identifying animals um, that we need to target our antibiotic use towards differently. Um, one of the patterns that we've identified is animals that never respond to antibiotics. And so I recently had a bout of pneumonia and I've never had pneumonia in my life. It's the most painful thing I've been through. Um, and so these animals that don't respond to our antibiotic treatment or our first line treatment, I have a new new understanding of, of the animal care that we need to understand. Um, we need to address that pain. And if they're not going to respond to the antibiotic anyways, what kind of options do we have as beef producers, as, as feed yard um, people to provide them with the proper care? Um, so that, that kind of research is, is providing us with a little, little more answers that are less subjective, something that we can really go off of and works real time in the real world because that's our biggest challenge in the cattle industry is making sure that we can do that. Um, the automated syringe technology, the, the pork and poultry guys um, are the experts on this because they've probably been using it much longer um, than we're thinking about putting it into place on targeting our antibiotic use. If you think about at the feed yard, when, when I do use antibiotics on a, a pin of cattle as a, as a mass treatment or metaphylaxis treatment, we're going off the average weight of the pin because we have to. Um, and so some of those animals weigh 650 pounds, some of them weigh 750, and we're dosing everything at 675. Um, it's, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to decide that that's not the ideal usage of antibiotics. It probably, it, it may not make a big difference in the, in the profitability margin of things, but my husband's an ex offensive lineman and in the human sector he gets the same dose as I get um, and so when we look at that one health conversation and where do we think problems are I think that's a problem in our industry and maybe we can solve it um, by using something like an automated syringe um, and it allows us to real-time connect with the with the scale and give that 688 pound critter the right dose at the speed of commerce, because we've, again, got that challenge of making sure that we can fit into the feed yard setting. Um, the algorithm-based ear tag monitoring system, I really shouldn't be the expert talking on that. That's Dr. Dave. Um, it's his baby, it's his project, but it is really neat that right now we use a lot of subjectivity in assessing sick animals. We have a cowboy check every single pin every single day. Um, you can imagine, a herd animal being pretty good at hiding if they're sick. And these tags afford us the opportunity to monitor their movement throughout the day. And then the next day, based on the algorithm that we've designed, we can see these are the animals that are sick. They didn't eat yesterday, they didn't drink yesterday, they laid down almost the entire day. Um, the cowboy wouldn't see that when he came into the pen, that critter might hop up and act like he's just fine. And so that's a pretty exciting research technology that's on the brink. It, it fits in really nicely with some of the traceability talks that you guys have had um, because I know technology will play a big role in animal traceability. It's not that far off from playing a big role in antimicrobial stewardship as well. So, Some of the opportunities in the future are the things that being a um, person who I, I have a lot of my career left. I know Dr. Sybil is trying to retire <laughs> um, but I have, I have a long ways to go, and so I, I try to think of what are my goals to see things um, get accomplished during my career in animal health. And I think we've got to do a better job in animal health at measuring and benchmarking. How are we defining antimicrobial stewardship? We don't have some of those things figured out, but once we define it and then move forward, how are we going to measure if we're successful? Um, if what we're doing is making a difference for the biggest problem, antimicrobial resistance. Because it's a hot button topic, but it's a problem for all of us. It's our family's problem and it's our business's problem. And so we've got to figure out how we can measure and benchmark in the future. Um, 
the other thing I think is at the forefront of everyone's mind is consumer confidence. Obviously, if we don't have our consumers' confidence, we won't be profitable or sustainable, which is sometimes go, always goes hand in hand in my mind. And so um, that building consumer confidence, I think that's a powerful way if we kind of get on the forefront of the One Health conversation and make sure that, that we're leading the way in that. And then obviously the topic coming up on, on traceability, I think... Uh, we can improve animal health through improved traceability. Um, I do not want to be at the end of my career and not have a handle on animal traceability. I will be a very sad retired veterinarian if that's the case. Um, so I'm just hoping uh, that we've talked about it for a long time. It, we've hashed it out. It's time to, like Eric said, it's time to put our boots on the ground and just finish it. Um, and so I commend all of you for being involved in that and being um, interested in it, I guess, because we've got, it's, it's time that we do something on the traceability front. So. so Leah called me up and said that she had a difficult time getting the folks from the pork board or veterinarians in the pork industry that are working full time. And so since I spent 17 years in the pork industry during pseudorabies eradication and, and was a past president of the American Association of Swine Veterinarians, that's still near and dear to my heart. So I'm the stand-in on the pork industry today. Um, and I want to be sure and thank Chris Rodemaker because Chris is, uh, in fact, the person that put these slides together. And Leah, don't worry, I hid at least 12 of these slides. So, you're, so, so she was worried I was going to use all 26 slides and we were going to be here until tomorrow morning because I could do that on this topic. Am I not smart enough to get this figured out? Probably. Oh, button. that button. It's forward. It's like an arrow. Once again, a great woman took care of the problem. <laughs> um, this is a reminder that the animal protein industry literally uses most of the antibiotics in water and feed. And I cannot point out enough why that's a big deal. Veterinary Feed Directive is making a very big impact in that space, and this is sort of a, a, a program, a graph, that makes sure that you understand that. And this is the reason, and this is very important, that the world outside of animal agriculture thinks agriculture uses too many antibiotics. And it is a global, global deal. In two weeks, I'm headed to the UK, and I'm sitting down with 20 people, and we're supposed to come up with a plan to advise the United Nations on what we're going to do with countries that aren't in a stewardship program anymore. So this is as big as it gets, ladies and gentlemen. As it relates to agriculture and productivity, the use of antibiotics and the availability of antibiotics going forward is a major, major issue that we're going to have to deal with. And I'm going to say it more than once. Every single agricultural person in the world at some point is going to have to measure and record an antibiotic dose in an animal. Some, some countries are going to be sh faster than others, but that's how we're going to be forced by society to manage our decisions antibiotics. Just a reminder, even before veterinary feed directive, we were moving down in the use of antibiotics. And I don't want to steal Hector's thunder, but even before veterinary feed directive, 40% of all the broilers in the United States had quit using antibiotics. Did I get close, Hector? And for those of you that are paying attention, that means that something in the neighborhood of 35% of the total use of antibiotics in the chicken industry was already being reduced before veterinary feed directive came about. So when someone from the human side says, you're not doing enough, the proverbial bullshit should come out because we've been doing more than human medicine for a long time. The 2016 report, and I'll remind everyone, the veterinary feed directive came out the 1st of January 2017, showed that medically important antibiotics decreased already by 14%. 
For those of you that think we're not doing very much in animal agriculture, you're not paying attention to the signals. There's two or three folks, Dr. Soklocha, Dr. Dorman, do a great job of telling people all the time all the good stuff we're doing. But there has to be more voices in that space. <clears throat> As veterinarians have been asked in the swine industry about what's going to happen in veterinary feed directive, this happened to be, I believe, if I remember right, 2016. Over half the veterinarians in the feed space or the swine space said we're going to reduce a lot of antibiotics. And all signals in the pork industry say at this point there's been at least a 40% reduction in antibiotics in the feed. Now, that data won't become available for some time, but that's what the signals are saying. The signals are from sales, the signals are from lots of things that are going on in the swine industry. This one is a big one, and this one is one that we have to get our head around. The number one way that antibiotic use is going, and stewardship is going to be executed is going to be through advanced vaccinations for prevention. And to put this in perspective, there's a real life example in the swine industry. Porcillus, or Lawsonia, is an enteric disease that for a long time had been managed by antibiotics in the feed. And if you've been in the swine business, you're completely aware of that. Guess what happened within 90 days of VFD? Anybody want to guess? We took antibiotics out of the growing fig, pig stage and in the early grower stage, and the incidence of Lawsonia went up 300%. Dimension of unintended consequences. Now, the good news is there's at least two vaccinations on the market to help that, and the better news is that in the first six months, the use of that vaccine quadrupled from the two companies. Why? Because they didn't have antibiotics to take care of the enteric disease. Okay? The swine industry leads all of the protein industries in the number of EFDs. <coughs> Full stop. Okay? Now it gets dicey. If you're the manager, Tara, how many cattle on feed? 250. And you probably have what? 150,000 five weights or younger come to your yard. And you probably say to yourself, I'd rather treat them in the first week as opposed to waiting for them to get sick. I know, you're changing, you're changing your ways. My point is this. Every single time I sit down with human medicine folks, and it doesn't really matter if I'm here or in China or in Vietnam or Europe or wherever, and I do a lot of that, you know what the first thing they want us to do? Quit preventing use. Don't use antibiotics for prevention. You're overusing it. And then I say to them, we got veterinarians in the United States that are responsible for over 200,000 animals at a time, and if they don't use prevention, we're going to have a lot of animals die. How are you going to deal with that? Well, get more veterinarians. That's their answer. Logistically not possible. <laughs> But we got some states that are out of control, and there's all kinds of laws being projected about banning the use of prevention. Be careful. If you're in those states, you better be really active, and you better have your associations active, because there is no science that suggests this is the right decision. This is a social and political issue. There's all kinds of definitions for judicious use. I'm going to give it very simple. Use the right amount at the right time for the right length of time. That's judicious use. That's not a hard decision if you've got enough information about the operation. However, as Eric has said and others have said, there's going to be a long list of those things that you should do as a producer to help make better decisions about when you use antibiotics. I think life should be simple. You should make decisions, is the animal sick from a bacterial infection and do I have an antibiotic that works and if I do, can I make sure it gets into the animal at the right amount? 
That sounds wonderfully simple until 10 pots show up because the price went down last week and we've been waiting for a price break and we got it and all of a sudden our handlers at our feed yards have 2,000 animals to process on Monday instead of 200. That's never happened, right, Tara? Not recently with the cattle market. <laughs> <laughs> as, we say, as, as the pig industry looks at this, they've been dealing with it very well. They have really, really strong sort of veterinary support. They are really doing a good job on the veterinary feed directive. But we've got to continue to ring this bell. When you choose to use antibiotics, you're going to have to ask yourself more than one question. Is it justified? Is there other alternatives that will be just as good, like extra bedding or more heat? Can I put it through the water for fewer days? Can I keep it out of the feed? And it can't be a tool we reach for without a very discerning aptitude for the decision process. More veterinary oversight is going to be useful and all production systems are going to have to be part of the collaboration to use the least amount as possible. It's not about reducing it, it's about optimizing the use. Compliance with the regulatory requirements and PQA plus in the pig industry is a big deal. They like to use this because they have simplified it. It says, understand the new feed directive, strengthen your VCPR, veterinary client patient relationship. For those of you in the cattle industry, I want to throw this out to you. What percentage of the cattle that are born in the United States every year, and that, that number is around, with the dairy animals, is around 32 million calves a year. That changes from time to time. What percentage of that cattle business never sees a veterinarian until they're harvested? It's not quite that high, but it's disturbingly high. Still over 30%. Now remember, the feed yards almost all have veterinarians, so unless they're being fed in small operations, it doesn't happen. But you don't want to say those kinds of things to human medicine because that makes it sound like veterinarians aren't giving advice. We're giving a lot more advice today than we ever have. There's lots and lots of uh, sort of opportunities for food animal veterinary medicine and they're going to get bigger because antibiotics are necessary for animal welfare, for better animal care, they're necessary for reducing suffering, the list goes on and on. So that's a tool that we need to have hang around. Yes, we're going to have more record keeping compliance. I don't know when. But based on the conversations I'm having with the politicians in the human medicine, we are going to have to record antibiotic use somehow, some way. Electronically is going to make it easier, but the days are going to soon behind us that we're not recording antibiotic use. I'm going to leave the group with this and then we'll have a panel discussion later. Take appropriate steps to decrease the need. That doesn't mean reduce antibiotic use if it's needed. That means what other things can we do to take better care of the animals, like Tara's talked about with the bedding, that reduces the amount or the need of antibiotic. That's optimizing animal comfort. Optimizing animal comfort is a really big deal. You have to ask the question, do I absolutely need the antibiotics? Many times the answer is yes. But there are going to be times when maybe not. I, I, I love to tell this story in the, in the cattle business. This is a pig presentation, but it fits. If you're riding pens, what is the number one signal of an animal not feeling well? Didn't go to the feed bunk. How many things go wrong in an animal that doesn't want to go to the feed bunk? Yes, it can be pneumonia, but it also can be acidosis. Does antibiotics help acidosis? We did two or three studies looking at calves that wouldn't go to the feed bunk that went to the hospital pen and we looked at the temperature. What percentage of the calves that went to the hospital pen didn't have a temperature? In this two studies, more than 25%. What did the cowboy do? Gave them antibiotics. Why? Because they weren't eating. 
Did they have pneumonia? Highly unlikely. Okay? Fully in implement management practices and continue to have a very, very strong veterinary client patient relationship. The pig industry has done a really good job of that. If you look at pig.org, it's got a magnificent rendition of stuff going on in that area. They, they are, in my mind, a stellar, stellar example of communicating what they're doing right and putting it in a website in a form that actually gives us direction. So if, even if you're not in the pig industry, take a look at pork.org because it really gives us some, some very, very nice information. What did I say? Pork.org. Thank you. Did, did I say pig.org? Okay. We said pig didn't work. Pig didn't work but pork you know, there are occasions when I get confused. You know, I'm, I'm retired. I don't, my mind's not working as well. Okay. Um, <coughs> lastly, guideline one use professional veterinary input. Antibiotics should be used for prevention, control, or treatment. We've got to work really hard at keeping prevention and control in our armamentarium because there's a bunch of people that want us to remove that and only use it for treatment. That's not going to work for animal agriculture at any level. Limit antibiotic use, treating the fewest animals possible. Make sure that you're looking at the class of antibiotics that you're using. Try and avoid those antibiotics that are used heavily in human medicine. We've got, to, we've got to move in the direction of using antibiotics as they're intended and not mixing them. And yes, we still have some people, unfortunately, that mix antibiotics. And animal comfort. It's a big deal. And we're going to get better at that. Well, I'm, the third, I'm third at three, so you, a lot of what you already heard, I'll try not to repeat as much of that. Poultry veterinarians are pretty much a small group. We know each other very well all over the world, and especially in the U.S., and we all belong to the American Association of Avian Pathologists, and the ones that are veterinarians to the American College of Poultry Veterinarians. So we work pretty closely with AAAP, and AAAP works very closely with AVMA. And so the stewardship definition that you see here is basically the same one as AVMA. It's, we just replaced animal with poultry, basically. Okay? So, and like previous speakers just said, it refers to the actions that we take to minimize or reduce the need for using antimicrobials in our flocks in this case. Um, some peculiarities about poultry practice because we're talking about beef, we're talking about pork, we're by far the most vertically integrated of any industry and have been for many more longer years than any others. So traceability for us is, is a thing of the past. Uh, I will retire having achieved that <laughs> or having seen that in my career. Um, so just to give you an idea of why I'm saying that, basically we're fully integrated the poultry company owns the chickens or turkeys and also owns the breeder flocks that supply the hatching eggs to the hatchery. And the company also owns and manages the hatchery and delivers the chicks or poults to the contract growers. The growers provide facilities, fuel, fuel and care for the flocks as per poultry company's programs but the poultry companies own the feed meals and have poultry nutritionists on staff. So the poultry companies, through their nutritionists, formulate, mix, and deliver feeds to the contract growers. The poultry companies also have poultry veterinarians on staff. Leah works a lot with Sanderson. Sanderson has three full-time dedicated poultry veterinarians just for the field. They have others working in processing and so forth. Um, so it's, like I said, the whole system is very integrated. These veterinarians are, um, all of them have specialized in poultry medicine. They either have a Master of Avian Medicine degree or an internship like I do or some type of further training from school. And they're responsible for designing and managing all the health programs and disease problems that occur within the various complexes that produce the chickens or turkeys. 
The companies also own the processing plants, and really the brands that finally reach the consumers. So at the end of the grow out, the poultry companies, uh, the poultry company will pick up and transport all the birds to the processing plant that were raised by the contract growers. And the poultry companies will pay the contract growers based uh, in a ranking on, based on overall performance and contract agreement. Now, with that in the background, antimicrobial use in poultry, well, first of all, for those of you that are not familiar with the industry, we hold anywhere from 20,000 to 40,000 chickens in, in, a, in a single chicken house or chicken barn, whatever you call it, depending on where you live. So we actually do practice population medicine. We are the example of population medicine. <laughs> There's not going to be individual treatments like, like I'm showing here. This is not going to happen except in countries like my own, Mexico, where labor is cheap and they can afford to go pick up 30,000 birds and give them a shot of whatever antimicrobial they decided to use. That's very seldom going to happen in the U.S. unless we're talking very valuable birds like breeder birds or turkeys near market age, something like that. So for the most part, what we're going to use, uh, like Dr. Siebel mentioned, is oral administration. We're going to deal with antibiotics either through the drinking water or the feed. Uh, one, one way of injecting them that has been popular for years has been ennoble. In other words, we can, we developed a machine. We had a little crazy Indian uh, born researcher that came and decided that we could vaccinate embryos against Marek's disease and they, they would produce immunity. And uh, having achieved these, well, that little injecting, injection has been used for other things. One of them is to administer antimicrobials. So we have had companies that for a long time have used uh, things like aminoglycosides, like genomycin, Inovo, by in, Inovo administration. Uh, and at one time, cephalosporins, they're still approved. The, the, the extra-label drug use of cephalosporins in poultry is prohibited, but uh, it is still approved for day-old injection in chicks and, and poults. Um, so those are the only times when we've injected anything. Uh, and, and like I said, the Enovo is extra-label, so a veterinarian has to be involved. Like I mentioned before, if you go to AVMA's webpage, you will find our guidelines for judicious therapeutic use of antimicrobials in poultry. Uh, prior to that, we had developed in conjunction with uh, FDA, CVM, and AVMA our judicious use of antimicrobials for poultry veterinarians. And in poultry practice, our goals are obviously to address the health needs and wellness of poultry while at the same time protecting um, food safety and public health. We strive to optimize therapeutic efficacy and minimize resistance to antimicrobials. Um, and antimicrobial use can be minimized through carefully planned and expected preventive practices, as has been mentioned before. And microbial therapy is an important is an important tool. Uh, you remember our first speaker showed uh, our first speaker showed us the toolbox, and she mentioned the same thing. It is a tool, but it is a very important tool in aiding veterinarians in maintaining poultry health and welfare. Uh, judicious use should not be interpreted as no use. Those are two different things. We should never withhold treatment from a sick animal when it is uh, medically justified. Um, so judicious use is an integral part of good veterinary practice. It's an attitude to maximize therapeutic outcomes, minimize selection of resistant microorganisms. 
And our judicious use principles are a guide for optimal use of antimicrobials. They should, however, judicious use, like I mentioned before, should not replace our professional judgment or compromise the poultry health or welfare. Um, I do have great concerns even today that if you talk to your peers one-on-one -on -one with in confidence after knowing them more than 30 years, uh, I know there's pressure not to treat when you're committed to these NAE programs. No antibodies ever. Uh, like Dr. Siebel mentioned, just with one of the largest going signing on, you're talking about almost 40 half percent of the market is already committed to no antibiotics ever. And there is pressure to withhold treatment, I know, from some of these in flocks, and that's where, that's where we need to strive to re achieve the right balance and treat when it's needed. As long as it's appropriate treatment, nobody should be concerned with that. So flocks should receive prompt and effective treatment by the attending veterinarian. Other general principles, preventive strategies, a holistic approach, um, which is basically what we mentioned before. Oh, I don't know what happened to my. I, I can tell you what's in it. I can, I can just tell it to you. It's, it's a nice little picture, but uh, you won't be able to see it. Uh, basically what I had is at the center I just had healthy for the flock, and the key to keep the flocks healthy depends on a large number of factors, some of which have been mentioned before. For example, keeping the right <coughs> environmental temperature, in other words, keeping birds in that thermoneutral zone where they're happy, not letting them get too hot or chilled, will prevent stress and minimize need for antimicrobials. Ventilation, keeping the right balance, keeping the moisture levels in the litter, in the litter in that house at the right level is critical. Too much moisture leads to bacterial challenges, mycotoxin growth, uh, coccidial growth and coccidiosis leads to necrotic enteritis, for example, which is what we use the so-called growth promoters before for prevention. So keeping the right uh, balance as far as ventilation, maintaining levels of oxygen and CO2 at the right target, ammonia levels below 25 parts per million because we know higher than that will cause damage to the cilia of the trachea and therefore predispose birds to infection, minimize levels of dust, um, uh, sure. Uh, and other things we do is like manage our litter. Litter, the downtime, which is, there it is, it's back. Thank you, Leah. Um, it's not quite, but showing part of it anyway. <laughs> it's got us a strip here in the middle for whatever reason. It's better than what you had before, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> so anyway, so downtime is important, especially these NAE programs we were talking about. Some of the companies that are working have expanded it from 10 days to 21 days, for example, and they're composting the litter, uh, letting it go through a heat process to decrease the challenge. Vaccination was mentioned before by both uh, speakers, that's something we can do in some cases. We don't have uh, the, the vaccine for necrotic enteritis yet, which is what we really need because vaccinating with live coccidiosis vaccines really predisposes birds to necrotic enteritis. Um, pest control, obviously nutrition plays a very new and, and even more important role in these birds raised without antibiotics. And other things like biosecurity, all of these are examples of factors that we can enhance to uh, keep us from having to use antimicrobials. 
Um, other general principles. Consider other therapeutic options when feasible. Obviously, as veterinarians, we must meet the requirements of having a valid client-patient relationship. And for prescription drugs or those by a BFD order or extra-label drug use, obviously all, all requirements of a valid client-patient relationship must be met. Extra-label drug use must only be used in accordance with the AMDUCA or the Animal Medicinal Drug Use Clarification Act of 1984. We're going to work closely with personnel administering or dispensing these antimicrobials and try to optimize therapy based on science or the pharmacological studies if they're available. The more we know about the pharmacokinetics and dynamics of each drug in avian species, the better. It was mentioned before that we want to start going from the narrowest spectrum antibiotics of lowest, lowest medical importance uh, as possible and then move on to the others. <coughs> and we're always going to use culture and sensitivity results. We usually institute treatment right at the onset, but we also collect birds to send to the diagnostic lab or take cultures uh, and submit to the laboratory for bacterial culture and isolation and sensitivity testing. We're going to confine use to the appropriate clinical conditions, treat only for as long as needed, limit therapy to ill or at risk flocks, proper disposal of unused antimicrobials, and we'll keep accurate records of treatments and outcomes. Um, uh, Dr. Siebel mentioned about the now that they're really trying to limit therapy and restrict it only to eel birds and not those that are at risk of exposure. Um, so, you know, we'll go back to prophylactic use, metaphylactic use, therapeutic use. Uh, it keeps changing. And our core principles are basically the same as AVMAs. We're, we have to have a commitment to stewardship, good stewardship of antimicrobials, develop a system of care to prevent diseases, select and use antimicrobials judiciously, evaluate antimicrobial drug use practices regularly, and keep educating and building expertise. Um, above all, it requires leadership and commitment from everyone involved. And we as vet veterinarians must take action because if we don't, like he said, there's tremendous pressure from all over the world to reduce use, whether that's the right pram um, metric or not is, is, is a reality that what they want to see is meaningful reductions in overall usage. Thank you, Dr. My name is Joe Swedberg. I'm retired from Hormel Foods. I spent 34 years with the company. I retired as Vice President of Legislative Affairs, Regulatory Affairs for the company, a couple of years ago. Um, I'm also involved with the, the Farm Foundation. It's a 90-year-old organization based out of Chicago. It's a non-lobbying organization. The best thing I can say about that is it's a, it's a convening organization. Uh, we bring uh, together groups for we bring together groups for on food and ag issues, which uh, are critical, and this is one of them. Um, we uh, started out about three years ago uh, having a meeting at FDA with Bill Flynn, Mike Taylor at the time, and, and talked to them about the implementation of guidance 209 and 213 in the VFD. And at that time, they had only been able to do five uh, listening sessions or education sessions, and they didn't even cover the southeast. So we uh, talked to them about joining forces and uh, going out and conducting 12 sessions around the country, which we ended up doing in geographic areas in 2015. 
And uh, it turned out quite well. We did surveys, et cetera, got all this back, found out where the gaps were. Um, and of course, since then, we have implemented 209, 213, the VFD. Um, and I think that was a contributing factor. During that process, the Pew Charitable Trust contacted us uh, from the Farm Foundation. They met out, we met in Phoenix at one of our roundtable meetings. Uh, Kathy Talkington, who came in um, just before that and early, I think in late 2014, and Karen Holzer, who, Dr. Karen Holzer, who's the veterinarian uh, on the group, and, and quite frankly, had really flipped their views on dealing with this. It, it, it used to be more, from my perspective, and maybe some of yours, a confrontational approach. Uh, it was more, you know, kind of beating at the other side if you had a different view. Um, that had changed in our view and that meeting. Uh, they talked about looking at a collaborative way or there are ways we can work together. They actually contributed to the education and guidance uh, sessions we did around the country. And so after that, um, we talked with each other and, and what's next? Um, can, we, can we bring a convening group together to talk about stewardship and principally come up with a stewardship definition um, and stewardship guidance and um, implementation process, which is what we've been working on since uh, December 2016. And so to date, we've had about five meetings. The, it, the participants in this group um, have been the processors. We have all the major processors, uh, the pharmaceutical companies. Kerry was with, of course, Elanco is here. Uh, and was a, is a part of the group, uh, working group, so you can ask him some questions later on if I miss something. Um, we also have in the livestock groups, which quite frankly was a, 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 a big job getting to convince them to come to the table at this. They had not had good experiences with Pew Charitable Trust uh, in the past, and that was very evident. Uh, we, I, I spent an hour on the phone with Neil Dirks at NPPC and Neil and I have known each other for a long time, and uh, they, they came to the table also and have been at the table. So it was a process. The first couple meetings were really uh, just getting to know each other, starting to feel a little bit comfortable with each other. And um, by the third meeting, uh, some of you may know Steve Solomon. Steve used to be the CDC. Steve is actually chairing this uh, group. He's, he's done a terrific job in hurting the cats and it's, it hasn't, hasn't been an easy one at that point. Um, so what, what have we got done so far? We have a definition that's pretty well finalized for stewardship. Uh, I give Dr. Karen Holzer a lot of credit. She took all of the definition, if you imagine all the stewardship definitions out there, she took them all and then she started pulling like words out of them and comparing them. And so all of a sudden we had this, this uh, chart up there and it had words that were similar basically in all these stewardship definitions and we ended up hammering out a definition in about two, two, two of the meetings where it took the medical industry um, about 70 years I think Steve Solomon says to come up with a stewardship definition so we came up with it within a few months uh, I think it's a pretty darn good one uh, I think it covers the broad basis it's, it's not pitting you know, one side, if no antibiotics ever, or the other side, give them antibiotics, it doesn't do that. It, it, it talks about responsibility and et cetera, which we're hoping to be able to release this summer uh, with regards to that. The next thing uh, that was involved with this, we, we started to build some, some core, what are the core components around this? And we have those basically in. And we, what we did again was, was pull from a lot of the organization's core components they already have around stewardship on, on um, antibiotic use and kind of use what was out there and then put it together in a document. Now the uh, heavy lifting is taking place. We're into subcommittees right now. Uh, there's some, I, and I, I forgot to mention uh, who else is participating in. We have some of the major retailers in, in Walmart's involved with it. Uh, food service, McDonald's has been, Chick-fil-A has been at the table. Um, we have uh, Albertsons at the table now, um, and they have been invaluable to this, this process and, and hearing from them and their perspective. Um, we've talked with FMI. Um, they are anxious to see what we come up with, and I can tell you that McDonald's, I can tell you that Albertsons and Walmart are all very anxious to be able to have a universal 
approach at this if there's things. So kind of get to the end game. You're thinking about audits, how companies get audited. How are you going to audit for, uh, for this? What's going to be involved with this? Well, one of the pieces of this whole thing is measurement. We have stayed completely away from measurement. The livestock groups are working with some experts in that area. You've got Mike Apley at K-State. Uh, Mike's working with the beef folks. You've got uh, Randy Singer at Minnesota. He's working with the poultry group. And uh, Peter Davies is working with the pork group. You've got some of the best people working on the measurement side. They're working in tandem with the USDA, excuse me, FDA. Mike Flynn and his group, we've stayed away from that. We have had the FDA and USDA in. They know what we're doing as a group. They know where we're at at this point. Um, we're, the real heavy lifting is taking place right now. We have their subcommittees, and uh, we, have, we have the definition, the core components. Now we're talking about what, are the what, what do you do to implement this? And we, by no means is this something that we're going to put out and say this is the you know, you got to do this is what it is. It, this is more of guiding documents, and we're, we're hoping that this will be able to be embraced. As you can imagine, uh, many companies get uh, audited and organizations get audited. If we can come up with a, a standard around this, some of you may be uh, aware of the GFSI uh, International, the Global Food uh, Safety um, Initiative, which... Uh, our Hormel had been involved with Cargill, a lot of other companies, but we're actually looking at the principles of that third-party auditing process that has been implemented with GFSI. Most of your major food companies and uh, restaurant associations, others have, have, have taken part of this, and that serves as a pretty good model to show you what could be done uh, with regards to this. So right now, we're, we're, we're doing some real heavy lifting in regards to uh, talking about the specifics with this, and that's the implementation. Um, then there's the communication side of it. How do we communicate this? What are we going to do to communicate this? And that becomes a big issue. Uh, we're also talking right now, who are we missing at the table? I told you we have the livestock groups, the pharmaceutical uh, processors um, at the table, uh, and, and food service, et cetera. Um, are there some other groups that we need to bring in now? And then the, you can imagine the communication side of this. How do you put, how do you get this out then? Um, and it's going to have to be working closely with the livestock groups. Um, fortunately, uh, it, this is an interesting one. I, I thought we were in the right direction when after the third meeting, I got a call from one of the major producer groups or livestock groups, and they wanted to put a press release out on what was going on. And their, their interest was, Instead of working in vacuums, we need to let the public know that this is a very complicated issue. There's a lot of good work taking place, and they wanted to start getting that out there so people would know what some of that work is. And that's what we are, are planning on doing. So um, not a done deal. I can't say it's a done deal yet. It's still a, somewhat of a delicate uh, process. Uh, but I, I can tell you, everybody that's at the table, all the major livestock groups, et cetera, are, um, I think, committed to this. Um, and we've got some heavy lifting to do these next few months, but I think we'll get there. So that's kind of a thumbnail of what we're up to and uh, what we've been involved with. Yeah. Our next meeting is the end of June, and that's going to be a very big meeting. It's June 28th. Um, that meeting, we're hoping to be able to finalize a lot of the stuff we've already been, uh, I just talked about, and, and come to some final um, resolution to some of that. So. Great. Uh, so, no big deal. That's, uh, that, that goes on me. Um, so we've heard from the protein groups. We've heard from kind of how would you define the space you're in, Joe? I mean, how would you define that space? And in the, in the, in, I mean, we have we have beef, we have poultry, we have yeah, have swine there. You know, this is just you know each of the, each of the, the the groups are doing some some really terrific work in this area. And, you know, you, you, at the end of the day, you look at this and say, well, who, what's the general public, who are they going to listen to? Um, you know, who can be a credible resource? And, and quite frankly, you know, Dallas Hockman from NPPC said this, we're, we, we need to be looking at it. one of our first meetings, Carrie, remember this, we're looking for, sh we need to talk about our shared values. And across these groups, we have shared values. And, and, and in the Pew organization, they have shared values. I can tell you, they've, they've been awfully darn good to work with. I give a lot of credit to Kathy and Karen Holzer for um, reaching out. MPPC invited Karen Holzer to Des Moines 
she had never been to MPPC. They never had somebody from Pew there. She spent two days there. I, I can't tell you how excited she was coming back from there and, and learning and impressed on what they were doing. The National Turkey Federation had her come in. And, you know, it's, it's the old adage. You, you know, have some communications. And you start talking. Uh, quite frankly, you can find some things in common that can be pretty darn good. So it's, 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 a, uh, it, it's been very rewarding for, from my perspective. Any questions for our panel? Yes. I've been wondering, and uh, I heard you know last, last summer when, when we were at IFAMA, the International Food and Agriculture Business Management Association, and you were on the panel with antibiotics there. And I didn't have a great chance to speak more to you, but I did to Walt. And wondering why exactly NIA and these two groups hadn't gotten together, together earlier why you and your groups hadn't been with you with the symposiums from NIA. And several times I said to Walt what's going on when he was editing his chapter. So again, are, are you seeing this coming together? Is this the first step in a smaller scale to then have you come up to the next symposium, etc.? your groups? Yeah, I think it's all Walt's fault, so. No, <laughs> um, no it, it, it is. You know, sometimes it, you know, you just... It's, it's right in front of you, and you should be connecting to some of these things. And I think uh, with Steve Solomon's involvement uh, in, our, in, in our, our group and now with working with uh, Walt and that group, um, starting to talk. I guess initially when we started this, we, 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 we kept it relatively low-key just from the fact that this was a very delicate situation. You can... It's, if you, I would have told you two years ago that you're going to have Pew is going to be working in a collaborative effort with all the livestock groups over a year, uh, I don't think you would have uh, believed me. And um, it, it's, it's gone remarkably well, but we still got some big work to do. And you're absolutely right. The more collaboration, I'm, I've already been asked, I'm serving on the planning committee for, for NIAA for this coming up here, so it's just starting to connect That's a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'll add a little bit of uh, information on the human health interface and, and One Health. Um, for those of you that do know this, Merck Human is a very big human company, almost ten times bigger than the animal health company, and we're third or fourth largest animal health company. But Three years ago, I sat in front of 50, more or less, MDs in our company. And I asked a very simple question to 50 MDs, all of which had more than 20 years' experience, all of which were in the antibiotic space. I said, do you know who FSIS is? Not one MD in the room knew that there was a USDA regulatory agency managing the integrity of the food that they were eating three times a day. The vacuum of information that exists between veterinary medicine and human medicine in this space is daunting at best. And it's going to take a significant amount of work to educate very sophisticated scientists in the human world about all the good things that are going on in the animal world. We're making progress, but the progress has to be far faster because as a point of reference, for every veterinarian that understands what's going on in the food animal world, there are 650 MDs that are not educated touching the public. That's a pretty big gap. And, and we're going to have to do more of that in order to get there and Organizations like Pew can help us a great deal in that space. And I think if you take it one step further, Rick, when you look at the human medical profession itself, when they talk about stewardship programs, it's focused mainly on antibiotics and use. When we talk about stewardship programs and animal health, you heard all three, all three of you talk about the holistic approach to the to environment, to preventive medicine, and it comes back to one point, and I don't mean to jump in here as a, as a chair, but one point that, that Lee and I have talked about before is we talked about every program looks for production of use. And, and what, what Hector described, what you described, 
Terry what Rick described was what we do to reduce the need. And, and that's a key point that, that when we communicate outside of our realm, that we, we need to start talking in that type of language. That it's reducing the need. The interventions and things we do is not strictly reduction of use because that immediately implies that we're overused. If we say if we're reducing the need, that goes to Hector's, on, Hector's point on being able to treat the animals when they need to be treated. So that, that's just two cents worth of growing there. So. Um, any other questions? Oh, we got one in the back. I'll we'll grab it. Go ahead, Michael. Then we'll get to the next person. This is more of a comment for Dr. Sybil. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but in Illinois, there's a bill in the Illinois Senate right now looking to ban preventative use of critically important antimicrobials, as defined by the WHO. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to knew about that. You might want to add that to your yeah. slide. Yeah, well, actually, we have a agency. We have a group in D.C. We put a veterinarian in that human group, which is the policy group in D.C. They have activated several of our human colleagues that are managing state legislators and bills that are being prominently displayed or in committee. So we're aware of that. Um, we don't think the Illinois ones got out of committee yet. And if you tell me it has, then we're, we, 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 we missed that one. But there's, there's at least six other states that are in the same process. And so we're monitoring that. It's a bit scary. Um, there's a sense, and I, I can't understate this, there is a sense that population medicine, as Hector so aptly described, is a dimension of overuse. When you treat animals that are healthy within the population, you are overusing antibiotics. That's outside of the scope of animal health. But it takes a long time to sit down with medical doctors and try and explain to them why prevention is actually better judicious use than therapy. That is a concept that they do not get in medical school. Now, I could go in for days on this topic, but we're going to have to be very vigilant across all of our state associations to make sure, through multiple processes, that they don't put rules in the book that literally handcuffs us. You've just described a situation that's, that, that we know is there, so we're, we're paying attention. I hope we can stay ahead of it. Now, we did get it stopped in a couple of states with some pretty active information to some, some state senators, so perhaps we can continue that. Sure. So you, you also, to tie into this, you're probably familiar with the San Francisco ordinance that's coming into play in 2018, I believe. And um, so it was two weeks ago, I, I, had a, I called uh, Kathy Talkington and uh, Karen Holzer at Pew. They were aware of it, but we were trying to think of, you know, the, the, implement, the implementation of something like that, though they have, don't have a legal ground to do it, that... Your retailers and people are going to want to, you know, they're not going to want to go against the city, so it's, it's a public issue. But the danger is, is you could have producers push away, I'm not doing that, Why, you know, what are you going to do with this information? And the other side of it is, you know, where's the baseline for the information? Where's the metrics coming from? You don't know. So the danger of that happening is, is real, and it can be more damaging and confusing. So I had a conversation with Karen and Kathy. They had not planned to weigh in, but Karen has given a call into the lead commissioner on that. Um, I, I don't know if she's had the conversation yet, but their, their offer was to um, give them background on what, what I just explained, what is going on, and also give them background on the complexity of what they are asking for and the dangers of, of that uh, causing more damage than it does good, which I think is really the big issue. Yeah, right now there is an open period for comment. Yeah. So AAAP will resend right. our comments. So, you know, my thought on that is the comments, we can send in comments from companies and organizations and so on, but I think something coming from an outside organization like a Pew, who quite frankly has a big bully pulpit, uh, can have a lot more impact than coming from the 
producer or trade organization? I just had two uh, <coughs> related questions for the panel to uh, maybe weigh in on suggestions about how we uh, how we approach uh, sort of the big big questions. One of them, uh, Rick, Rick just touched on there from the last question, and that is um, there is a popular view in the medical community that it's better to visit the body shop than avoid this, avoid the smash in the first place. Um, you know, to us here veterinarians, it, it appears like yeah, why would you think that? Um, I got to say, in 20 years, we've made no traction on that issue at all. So question one, and then I'll do question two and you can hit them. Question one is, what do we need to do different? Because the previous plan about explaining why, you know, stitching time saves nine, prevention is better than cure, all those kind of nice and, uh, analogies and, and, and sayings are, are, are good. It just doesn't seem to get any traction when it gets to, uh, to animal health. Um, and then the second one is, uh, maybe uh, Joe touched on this in his presentation, and, and Rick said it by... Uh, by uh, sort of extension, and that is that uh, most of the strategies uh, that we look at in terms of uh, called stewardship um, somehow or other revolve around um, measuring quantities of use and then the natural extension, and we do that because it's easy, um, and then the natural extension of that uh, is also interesting. The natural extension of that is, well, what would be the answer to that? Well, then a number that's lower than last year's number would be a better number to have this year, and then we just sort of continue to zero, I guess. Um, so the question there is that the whole um, antibiotic strategy and global concern, the PACCA um, uh, initiative, are all about improving human health and antimicrobial resistance in human health. So, you know, the use of tetracycline, just to pick a drug that lots of companies make, the use of tetracyclines in pigs probably isn't impacting human health too much. It's going to get lots of airplay. Um, I don't think I've ever seen too much connection with how that's impacting. Um, tetracycline therapy in human health. How do we get the objective of the process up front? How do we actually end up, because we've you know, been working on this thing for 20, 25 years, we back to the Swan Committee 50 years, how do we actually put in place strategies that actually are likely to help human health rather than stuff that's easy to do, looks good, plays well with the public, makes it sound like we're doing something? So that would be the, that two easy questions for the team. <laughs> Who wants to start out? Patrick, do you want to start out? From? Uh, uh, he knows where I stand. <laughs> I mean, I, we've, been, we've been dealing with this issue for 25 years. Is, uh, yeah, is, is, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know where, where to go with the message that would get across. Uh, I'm surprised about the pew thing. I didn't know because in my, my perception has always been this is an organization that pretends to give the impression that they're science-based, where they're infiltrated by, by a bunch of animal <laughs> agriculture and antibiotic use activists. And uh, so I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised to hear that we're actually working with you for, for a change. Uh, but um, I think that's going to be the only way, Richard. I agree with you. The metric. I've said it forever. I mean, we're doing this to improve human health. Show me the improvements. Europe has already gone this way for a lot longer than we have. And uh, I keep showing that their latest antimicrobial resistance reports on human and animal isolates are still showing that they're plagued with resistance, significant problems. So what makes us think that this is going to be any better here? And we've seen some of the adverse consequences on animal health for sure. Just like you talk about the Lausonia uh, um, and pigs, it was the same thing with necrotic enteritis. I mean, there is, there is, I mean, I see it every week. And it's, it's, it's had an impact. And some some companies are handling better than others, but, but it's, it's, it's had an adverse impact on, on poultry health, at least at this point. I, I, I guess it's a learning curve as we learn more on how to deal with these things. Well, maybe like the Europeans and the better, maybe, maybe we'll be okay. But the bottom line is, can we find a better metric than just reduce use, reduce use, reduce use? I mean, it's, it seems like it, that there has to be a better metric than that. I think the metric would be fine if there was any linkage that there was a target to shoot for that actually achieved the goal, or that there was any, you know, sort of reasonable basis to show that there was actually the, there was actually the right path. It's just a path. It's easy to do because um, the uh, numbers. Um, I, I think it was if it was a step in the right direction, it'd be okay. But I'm not even convinced it's necessarily a step in the right right direction. And if we're doing one thing and we're focusing on that, and we're probably not doing other things.
things that we could do that might be even better. So maybe the second question that I directed to Rex is, he's the one who puts a foot in both camps, he's got access to the medical profession, he's got you know, access to the veterinary profession, been doing this for about a million years because he's older than me. Um, <laughs> so, Rick, you That's surprised... going to cost you a drink. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you were surprised the other day that 600, with 50 doctors, sorry, 50 doctors, or 650. 650. Um, a lot of them anyway, were unaware of the uh, steps in place. Um, also, you know, the, the doctors too tend to get a training that's, you know, they work at the body shop end of things rather than defensive driving thing because you don't tend to go to the doctor often when you're, when you're well, you tend to go when you're sick. Um, doctors are pretty smart people, they've got medical educations. How, how do we, how do, we uh, do a better job of, of communicating to them that prevention is a good idea um, and actually it's a higher moral ideal than, than treatment? So, as anybody that knows me, I too have been frustrated with this for a long time. So about four years ago, I made a very concerted effort to infiltrate our human medicine side of our business, which wasn't particularly easy, and I was told multiple times it would never happen. It is happening. It is making a difference, and everybody can make a difference if you'll sit down with an audience and ask the question, what do you know about the food that you eat? Let me tell you about some things that might be useful. I'm going to finish the conversation with two personal stories, both of which were tremendously positive in this space. One was we hired an intern from Harvard University in uh, master's. Uh, he, was, he was going after a master's in public health. And for those of you that follow public health institutions, Harvard is in the top three. So this is not a small institution. And we asked this young man who was an intern one question. We want you to do a meta-analysis of all the literature of the linkage between the use of antibiotics in veterinary medicine and animal agriculture and human medicine disease. He gave a presentation to 25 veterinary, sorry, MDs in the company, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I have spent hours and hours and hours looking for evidence of the linkage. There is none. The 25 MDs in the room were aghast because they made the assumption that the direction of animals to humans was, in fact, an infallible truth. Each and every time that that goes down and you spend time in that space, you educate a few more folks, and you're right. The medical profession is an open-minded sponge, and they're wanting best information. We're not getting there. We're making some assumptions we shouldn't. Second story. I befriended two people on the human side that we've become in very, very linked colleagues to the point that I get a call nearly every month, sometimes as often as twice a month, when they're doing things in the, an in the antibiotic space and they've begun to realize that there's a linkage to the food and to animal medicine to the point that one of those people asked me to be a co-presenter this fall in front of the world stage of human antimicrobial stewardship in Boston. Ladies and gentlemen, you can make a difference in this space because they want to know what we're doing right. And when you tell them what we're doing right, it is an audience that's ready to hear the story. Every one of you sitting in the room, this is going to sound like I'm a preacher at the pulpit, everybody sitting in this room has at least a half a dozen medical doctors that they're connected with. Reach out. Ask them. Communicate, educate them. They're getting questions every single day from their customer base, which is their patients, asking questions that they can't answer because they don't have enough information. It sounds complicated, but it's really only about, and Joe said it eloquently, when you sit down with a potential adversary or one that's a perspective adversary or a perception adversary, you find common ground and actually you end up being colleagues. I'm done with my speech. So, thank you, Rick. Two points to that and about the power of what we're doing with NIAA. When we're, when we're sending in CDC with our big producer group, Dr. Barnhart went over again some more diagnostics they did at the Cattle Empire. The head of the division, the boss of the gal that does the antimicrobial resistance, said, I want to learn more. I want, I want to have 
that group into the, the, to the point that they've invited one of them to Dr. Barnhart and Dr. Sloan to two CDC to present to the rest of the CDC. Now, what's the importance in that? Who creates policy based on science for the medical profession? The Centers for Disease Control. Having that access and that conversation and driving that, that issue with her is, is phenomenal. And so, because we have had great people there at the meeting, they're able to do that. Another quick example um, is when Dr. Sklutis spoke in Atlanta, he spoke about PI testing with DVD, population medicine. Well, I mentioned there's a d disconnect between stewardship and disease prevention in the human side. It's called Stewardship and Infectious S Disease Society. They actually fact function in vacuums on a lot of things. The, the people handling infectious disease don't work with the ones that are doing stewardship in most situations. I think you've seen that, Rick. And so they have a disconnect there that we don't have in our animal agriculture. You heard Hector's presentation on the whole big picture. But so things like that is what drives it. And so I'm going to give each of you just a short closing comment because we're running, running short on time and we need to do a couple of short business, a couple of business things. And but I would say stay tuned. This is why we do these symposiums, to continue that conversation, to make sure we have those same people that we can expand that horizon with. So um, who would like to go first on just the closing comment? Dr. Yes, Barnhart, would you like? Um, it kind of addresses some of the questions that you brought up, and, and I'm glad that the the very scary San Francisco ordinance got brought to the attention today, too, because um, Dr. Seclosia and I spent some time with the commissioners on the phone about our concerns from the beef industry standpoint, and you talk about metrics and how do we start measuring things. Um, we cannot let this conversation move to a volume-based metric. And volume-based is, is very dangerous for the beef industry. I think a lot of my colleagues would agree with that um, for different sectors of the industry. I have day-old Holstein calves in my care, and I have 1,250-pound ready-to-slaughter calves in my care. And we can't start making our decisions based on what would look better in the San Francisco ordinance. Um, and what they're asking for is volume. Um, you betcha we use more antibiotics in the human sector. There's more pounds of animals in the United States by a long ways than there are humans. Um, so we've got to get that conversation moved mig per kig, I think. Um, makes a lot of sense to me as a veterinary student. Um, I don't know. The CDC does a lot of their reporting on volume based in the beginning when they are trying to investigate a problem. And then they moved to a better metric. We can't have these conversations start in volume based. And so that's one thing um, I wanted to touch base on that just because talking about metrics, we've got to all get on the same page and decide what's important to move forward with that conversation. Um, and just I'm going to throw it out there again that by the end of my career, we've got to have traceability figured out um, because I think that is a very key player in antimicrobial stewardship, reporting, deciding if what we're doing is mattering. Um, we've got to be able to trace our products, and it's so important for the beef industry to get that under wraps because, as you guys mentioned, how we are the least vertically integrated, we have the biggest challenges there. And, um, being a member of the feeder sector, we get to see all the challenges um, with not knowing the history and not knowing the traceability on animals. So keep going forward and keep attending meetings like this because we've got to come up with the solution. Um, so I go back to what we were doing with Pew and the Farm Foundation. I, I, the, the stewardship definition, the core, core components, in implementation, which is, is, is working on right now, or, or it's a big deal. Um, but I think the communication is going to be the most important part of this, to your point and to Rick's point. And I've been harping on make it so your mother can understand it. Make it so it's a public document that people can really understand, because this is a complex issue. Antibiotics have become a competitive issue in, in some segments, and um, we need to help people understand both sides to that so they can make an own, their own educated decision on that. And I'll give you one, I'll, I'll close with one example, and it kind of goes with what Rick said is communicating. Um, 
I still do a couple things with Hormel. One of them is I lead Hormel's internal antibiotic discussion group. Um, Ashley was on that group for a while. And uh, we have Steve Solomon's in on it. Um, uh, Mike Apley's in on it. I've got some other folks uh, from different perspectives. But one of the um, groups many companies uh, are dealing with today is shareholder resolutions. There's a group called the ICCR, which is the Interface Center for Corporate Responsibility. And it is a religious-based organization that kind of uh, is the organization that represents uh, the faith-based organization's investments. So they have billions and billions of, of dollars, say, that this group. And they have meetings with corporations. They put up shareholder resolutions. And I can tell you up to the last two years, for three or four years, the resolution was an antibiotic reporting for, for Hormel Foods, and I'm sure with many other companies. And so they bring a, a pastor and a nun to the annual meeting, and they stand up and say this resolution, and et cetera. Um, our corporate communications folks and company have had meetings with them. We have quarterly phone calls. We have an annual meeting. Um, I've been involved in the last three of them because of the work we're doing now with Pew. Uh, and, and the Farm Foundation, they have completely switched the, from the aggressive approach and um, what are you going to do to measure antibiotics to they are thrilled that there is communications going on and they brought all these uh, producer groups, retailers, everybody's at the table and discussing this now. And I can't tell you what a big difference. We, had a, we were supposed to do it, we had an hour and a half call two weeks ago. We were supposed to be 15 minutes on antibiotics. It was an hour discussion. But it was a very productive discussion because they were asking questions. They're just amazed. Uh, several of our uh, folks from Hormel and um, Constance Cullen from the Farm Foundation went to one of their conferences recently, which was all one-sided. Prior to that, on the negative on animal you know, antibiotics used in animals or food producing animals, um, this had a balanced approach, and it was it was it was changing, and it's just what you're talking about. These these people now are saying, "Wow, this is more complicated than I thought," and it's really good to see that people are doing something about it and discussing both sides and trying to come up with some processes for it. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Jeff. Right. Okay. New science and the quest for new science is not going to change the minds of society. So if you're sitting in the room asking the question, how do I super convince society that we're doing the right stuff, don't go after new science. That's not going to work anymore. Now, do secondly, animal agriculture at all phases, especially in the Western worlds, especially in North America, already has a magically beautiful, positive story. We got to tell it. And it starts in your own backyard. Every single time that I hang out with someone that has a perspective that we're the villains, we're successful at bringing them back to at least neutral. Don't expect someone else to do it, folks. It ain't going to happen. The people sitting in this room, coming to these meetings, going to the associations, they're the ones that are going to make a difference in influencing those people that are ready to hear the story. They don't want their food to be bad. They want their food to be the right decision. It already is. How can we tell that beautiful story? It's already there. I am absolutely amazed every time I sit down with super educated people and they begin to understand what the world we're doing right and have been for 20 years. They are dumbfounded at how dang good we are. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we're, on, we're on the right track. The key is going to be how to get the message across to, our, to the consumer, like you said. Put it in simple terms where they can understand it and relate to it and uh, and see that there is a, there needs to be a balance because animals do get sick and it's not humane to withhold treatment from them. 
And actually, in some cases, you know, antibiotics are good for many reasons, for sustainability and a variety of other things that they can relate to. But uh, everybody said, well, take a stand. I mean, I've been very active on this issue. I, I've spoke to our Greater Athens Physicians uh, Association back in uh, 1999. And I was amazed, too, that they, they, they didn't know what antibiotics we use, how we used them, how there was no concerns, how the food supply was constantly monitored for safety and all of those things. So I think I think we're on the right track with the antibiotic symposiums, with the Farm Foundation, with all these things that are trying to bring the groups, um, all the stakeholders to, to the table and, and have, instead of an antagonistic, a more uh, friendly discussion, okay, we, we have common goals. How do we get there uh, without harming one side uh, and benefiting the other? Uh, I, I think that that's the key. If, if we can get that message across, and I think we seem to be on the right track. I'm very encouraged by hearing what he says about Pew, because I had him in the worst possible cons that I was ready to act. It was a long time. You know, but I'm glad, I'm glad to yeah. hear that. Uh, Ain't done yet. Yeah, so <laughs> well, I think our panel's brought to light how complicated this issue is and, and that we have had successes. We are moving the needle and it, it's, it's showing in a positive direction. I think we need to give our panel a round of applause. <laughs>